went to the other slide there. Perfect, thanks. So uh, I'm happy to be here. My name is Ben Bull. I work for Oregon Tilt, which is an organic certifier. We certify all across the country and in Mexico and Canada. And my position at Oregon Tilt, I have a joint position with USDA and NRCS, and I provide assistance to NRCS um, on organic topics. And so I actually spend my days in an NRCS office, even though I work for an organic certifier. So I kind of work in that world of organic overlapping with conservation, and so those sorts of things. So I'm here and I'm going to talk about soil and water conservation in organic agriculture. So I wanted to, for me, whenever I'm talking about organic, I first want to talk about the standards, the, the USDA organic standards, because these are what the organic farmers have to follow. So I'll talk about that, talk about some organic practices and some research related to soil and water. And then I'll talk, I'll be maybe introducing some new acronyms, but I already put one on there. The, so the NOSB is the National Organic Standards Board, which is the place where change is made for organic standards. And so there's some discussion around change on, as it relates to soil and natural resources. So I just wanted to mention that because I think it's relevant. So first off, to talk about the organic standards. And, um, this is from the beginning of the standards. This is the organic production requirements. It says that practices must maintain or improve the natural resources of the operation, including soil and water quality. So these ideas of soil and water conservation are built directly into the regulations that all organic producers must follow. And there's a few more parts to mention about it. But I do want to point out that um, the level of detail in the regulation is not, it's not not very detailed and so this is the type of information that's in the regulations and so I know that for example in NRCS world when we're doing a practice standard for doing cover crops or something like that there's pages of seeding rates and planting dates and all those sorts of things and so the organic standards are, are broad and they don't have those specific kind of standards in them but it's purposefully written that way because it has to cover farms in all over the world and producing different things, different types of crops, and so they're kind of purposefully a little bit vague and are more principled um, than specific standard. So one of the big uh, standards that everybody probably associates with organic is that you're not supposed to use chemicals. So there's a prohibition on most um, synthetic materials and most um, non-synthetic materials are allowed, although there are a few exceptions on both sides of that, and that's what's known as the national list. And so there are some exceptions to that general rule of thumb, but uh, in general, synthetic substances aren't used. And in terms of fertility and nutrient management, um, organic producers are told to manage the crop nutrients through rotations, cover crops, and the application of plant and animal materials. They must manage plant and animal materials to maintain or improve soil organic matter content. So this, the types of fertility that they're using are, again, their, their rotations, your cover crops, and manure are the main um, sources. Um, crop rotation is a requirement in organic standards, and it's really um, important, as I'll, I'll highlight a little bit more. But the, uh, this is from the standard. It says that producers must implement a crop rotation, including but not limited to sod, cover crops, green manure crops, catch crop, crops that provide the following functions. So the, they must do, use a crop rotation to um, meet the goals of maintaining or improving soil organic matter, pest management, uh, managing deficient or excess nutrients, and providing erosion control. So each of those pieces, like the cover crop and sod, isn't necessarily required. It's just you have to have a rotation, and the purpose of the rotation is to deal with pests and um, nutrient management and those sorts of things. And in terms of uh, pest management, um, I think it's important to point out that this uh, part of the rule is structured as a, in, kind of in phases. So organic producers must first try to prevent pest problems by doing things such as crop health or resistant varieties. And then after they try to prevent, they can use mechanical, physical, or cultural methods to address 
insect or weed pest. And then only after those methods are insufficient can they use any of the materials that are allowed in organic. And so they can't just substitute. Um, if, they, if you're transitioning from conventional to organic, they can't just substitute organic materials day one. They have to follow the sort of tiered approach of trying to prevent and avoid and use other methods to deal with them before you can use an approved material. Um, and these are the types of things that producers are using for weed management. The, these are the ones that are listed specifically in the regulation as examples for things they could be doing for weed management. That's mulching. Um, if you can use fully degradable mulches, or if they want to use a synthetic or plastic mulch, it has to come off at the end of the season. And then things that we might think of, cultivation or um, mowing or um, flame weeding or other things that they're using for to control weeds. And then the types of things listed in the rule around pest management be the introduction of predatory pests, um, habitat for um, beneficials, um, and then some non-synthetic controls. So that was just my, my brief touch on the regulations that I thought were relevant to what we were going to talk about. Does, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free. And I know there's a lot of people in the back, but you can uh, speak up. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'm happy to take them. Yes? Right now, just a quick question about yeah. organic practices and organic materials. OMRI yeah. certified is not always the same as organic certified every time, or do you, does this standard go to the OMRI list? Right, the OMRI list is the place to go, actually. Okay. And it so is. The, okay. that is the folks at OMRI compare the materials to the USDA organic rules. And so that is the, the rule of thumb. So that's the highest use. level one that one should consider because there's yeah. a lot of other Right, the, the OMRI list is like a go-to list. And I would say certifiers look at the OMRI list if they don't have their own internal list. But uh, if I were advising a producer, I would say look on the OMRI list, but, the, but they should always check with their certifier before using a new material that they've never used before because it would be possible that it would be outdated or, or something like that. But it's pretty updated. But that's, the, that's a go-to list. And I would point that out as a major resource. That's OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute. And labels will sometimes have an OMRI approved um, logo on it. Yeah, and Washington State Department of Agriculture, the WSDA has also a list that they have made public. And most other certifiers keep their lists like more internal because they're not putting it out that everyone can use. But OMRI is an independent group that does it. There's a lot of lists out there, and as an entomologist, as we try to add organic materials to our recommendation books, for instance, we're trying to decide should we just go to OMRI? And there's quite a discussion about that amongst us, so I can just yeah. say to them, yes. Yeah, from a certified perspective, I would say look to OMRI. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else have any question on standards or regulation? Thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk about some practices and some research related to these, these two topic areas. Um, so there are a handful of long-term organic and conventional comparison studies that have been done in different parts of the country, and I'll talk about a few of them. There was a review in 2015 of the different um, comparisons, and I, from that I pulled out some best practices, and I think these are also best practices that I see on kind of successful organic farms. And so while a crop rotation is required for organic producers, I think of an extended and more diverse one provides the greater benefits. And so you'll see in the studies that I'll, I'll mention that the, the, the rotation that's having the greatest impact on the soil quality, or in, um, specifically on soil quality, is the more diverse and the longer rotation. And so even though there is a rotation requirement, the greater the rotation, the better, I think. Um, including cover crops in the rotation, definitely a best practice. Cover crops aren't required per se. It, it, um, they're mentioned as part of the rotation, but m pretty much all um, organic crop producers that Oregon Till certifies do use cover crops. But um, so it's not necessarily cover crop isn't a requirement. But I would say that it's very widely used. Um, so soil quality is the main driver of optimal organic crop yields, and that soil organic matter management is key and so for in the short term for fertility and mineralization and then in the longer term for soil um, soil quality 
and we'll see a lot that both manure and legumes are important for fertility in, the, in most of the systems. So one of the ones I wanted to highlight first here in Maryland is the uh, Beltsville Farm and Systems Project. And this is Michelle um, Cavagelli, which was from USDA ARS Ag Research Service, shared this, these slides with me. So it's credit to Michelle for, showing, for sharing these. Um, but these plots were established in 1996. They're um, all rotation points present each year. They use commercial scale equipment, and it's one of the five side-by-side -side comparisons in the U.S. that uses no-till as one of the conventional treatments. So um, just to show you, the, they have five different systems or five different rotations that they're comparing. So there's two conventional, those are the first two, and both of those are in a three-year. There's a no-till and then a, a conventional till, and those are corn, soy, um, and then it has the rye and the, the winter wheat in there. Then in the organic systems, there's three rotations, a two-year, a three-year, and a six-year. And really what's differentiating the one at the, like, okay, is the three years of alfalfa at the end. That's what's extending the longer um, organic treatment. And in terms of fertility for the organic, they're using poultry litter before the corn and the wheat and they are tilling the organic tree. The organic are all receiving tillage. Um, so in terms of some of the results, so the soil organic content is, is shown to be greater in all the organic systems than in the conventional no-till system over time. The soil organic carbon distribution, um, in terms of the depth in the, the first, the surface to five, first five centimeters, um, the soil organic content has been greater in the no-till than the conventional till, the organic and the um, conventional conventional till. <laughs> but at, at other depth, there's little differences. And uh, the six-year rotation has the greatest soil organic content. That was the one that has the three years of alfalfa. And again, just to my point about the longer the rotation having some of the greater benefits that I see. And I think important to point out is that the soil organic content levels were sustained despite the tillage in the organic system. And I, and I know that um, organic systems are frequently seen as um, getting um, negative reviews for the amount of tillage that's in it. But I think it's important to think about the whole system and what the producer is doing to mitigate the impacts of the tillage. And so if they are adding enough materials or, um, or adding uh, cover crops or manure or compost. And this year, in this rotation, the example having multiple years of alfalfa is really helping to offset the impacts of some of that tillage. Was, so, was that alfalfa harvested or was it all worked back? Um, I think he's ta they're taking hay off of it. Uh, this is just the data to show the soil carbon in the first meter of the soil profi profile. And you can see that the uh, the six year on the bottom, oh, and the three year has the, the greatest one. The, ch the, the conventional tillage one is having the lowest of figures. Um, and then another uh, finding from this is that the potentially miner mineralizable nitrogen in the organic systems was significantly greater than the conventional. And on average, it was 34% greater than conventional no-till after the 14 years. And you can see the, those figures in the chart here. And then comparing to the manure application, and so you can see the, the six-year rotation that has the alfalfa, there's, smaller, there's less application of manure because they're receiving some of the fertility from the alfalfa. Yeah? Why did they add manure to the conventional? Why do they not? Yeah. They're using a synthetic. But uh, most commercial, they use manure too. Sure. I mean, to make it all the same. Yeah. Like, would you use the same nutrients? I mean, because it's not like you're conventional, you're just using organic. You know, yeah, sure. One of the same. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. That, that's, a, that's fair. I'm not sure. It's pretty widely used conventional. 
Uh -huh. That's a good point. I, I can't say. I'm not sure of the answer to why they didn't use that, but that's a, that's a valid point. All right. So in terms of the overall comparison, in comparing their um, their organic rotations, the the uh, the longer, more complex one had greater yields, had lower weed pressure, and had re a reduced dependence on manure, which would have an impact on the phosphorus, and um, it had less soil erosion as compared to the other organic treatments. Now, yes. Milk soil is fairly flat. How do you think that would change if you went to a typical Piedmont area that had eight percent soil versus milk soil place? Sure. Yeah, I think um, you know it's gonna. Those things would definitely vary. I think this was just t comparing those systems amongst one another in one specific location, and so I definitely think you know it was kind of showing the benefits of those rotations as compared to the other rotations in that one specific place. And so I do think that they would have to be more concerned about potential for erosion in a place that had a greater slope, for sure. Um, so I wanted to show some information from another study. This is from the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. Chris Nichols shared some of this information. So the, the Rodale Institute, theirs is the longest running comparison of organic and conventional in the US. I'm sure you guys are probably, most of you are familiar with the Rodale Institute. They had recent, well this was a few years ago, I guess that they had their results on their 30, the 30 years of the study and they have, um, their rotation is, is more complex that I don't want, I wanted to share it, but I don't want to necessarily get caught down in it completely. But I wanted to point out a few things. So they have two conventional, there's a no-till and there's a till. And they um, introduced GMO crops in their uh, no-till in 2008. And those are both three-year rotations and they're using um, cover crops in the in the no-till one. And so what differentiates the um, organic treatments is two of them, the two four years are legume based for um, the fertility. They don't use manure in any of those, they just are using the cover crops. And then there's with and then there's two that are manure based and also have cover crops. And then also to differentiate between the, the four organic treatments there's two that are using conventional tillage and then there's two that are using, they call it no-till, I'm gonna call it reduced tillage because it's not a true no-till system, but they are using the roller crimper, which I'll discuss a little bit more later, to um, go to a reduced till or minimal till for the organic system. And they're using dairy or beef manure in that system. Um, so in the first 13 years, they really saw increases in soil carbon um, in the organic systems, not they didn't see change in the conventional systems there. Um, they are also looking at water, uh, the impacts on water quality. And so they've been analyzing water below the root zone in each system. And so the water leaching from the conventional system more frequently exceeded legal limit for nitrate nitrogen concentrations. So it was not that much higher than the 20% well, of conventional samples versus 15 in the legume in the manure based system had the, the lowest. Um, the, in the organic systems they had higher volumes of water percolation and that the, it was interesting that the organic systems performed, but had better yields in times of drought. And so the, that's the soil had been built up and was more resilient in those times of drought. And so that over time, this, this was a, a picture of one year in a drought year where the, in the organic is on the left. It was doing much better in that time, the time of drought. And there are higher percentages of water stable aggregates in the organic, and this is comparing the conventional, then the blue, or the, excuse me, the red is the organic legume-based fertility, and then the white is the organic manure-based fertility. So 
this, um, the whole soil stability index, it's dry and water, dry and water stable aggregation. So you can see by depth the, um, those values there. And that the, the manure-based system is having the pretty high values, um, and, but the conventional is pretty close in the beginning of at the um, at shallower depths. And this was just one of their takeaway in terms of the comparison. It, uh, they're I think proud of is showing is the yield comparison. So over time, well, it's certainly true in, when a conventional producer transitioning to organic that they do experience a drop in yield, sometimes around 30%, but that over time the yields increase and become a little more comparable. And so they've shown their yields, pounds per acres, to be slightly higher in organic. And I think part of that was they accounted for in the years of drought, the organic yields were outperforming. So I wanted to point out the roller crimper, or their, they call their no-till work, and talk a little bit about that, about how organic producers are trying to reduce tillage and some of the opportunities there. So um, the roller crimper is used to put a mulch on the surface to protect against erosion and rain impacts, and so it's rolling down a cover crop that was planted prior to the cash crop. And it, I wouldn't, so again, I'm not calling it a true no-till because there's often plowing prior to the cover crop establishment, which is what's subsequently rolled down. Um, so it's sort of a rotational no-till. And in terms of the crops that are frequently used, cereal, rye before um, soybeans, and then hairy vetch used before corn. And there definitely are some challenges with using the roller crimper. Say one of them is getting significant biomass from the cover crop before planting the cash crop because they need enough biomass to be able to roll it down and provide that mat to suppress the weeds. And so if there is if the cover crop hasn't grown well enough before the roll down, it could there's not that benefit to potentially be there for to, for providing the mat. And then there can be, based on equipment, there can be problems seeding into that mat. It can be rather thick if there's really <coughs> significant biomass in the cover crop. Um, also, fertility could be an issue in some systems. So they're using rye as the cover crop, so, or grains are better for weed control. But if they're relying on cover crops to provide some of the nitrogen to the system, then that could be a potential challenge. And then. Um, they're having challenges with ongoing weed control if the mat isn't providing a sufficient um, suppression of weeds. There is a 2011 study about conservation tillage issues. It's cover crop based organic rotational no till production in mid Atlantic. And so I just wanted to pull a couple things from that. And so, in the mid Atlantic region, here using this um, roller crimper system with cover crops have achieved corn and soybean yields that are compar comparable to county averages. And there were some variations, for sure. So the soybean yield was more consistent. They attribute this to the rye providing better suppression of weeds. It was a, developed better as a um, cover crop. And they were able to get in to plant the soybeans at a um, more typical date, where they had trouble getting in to plant the corn on time waiting for a cover crop to develop so that then they could um, crimp it. But they did find that um, using seeding rates and the timing of planting and looking at fertility, that they're able to achieve levels uh, necessary to suppress weeds. And that, uh, but the cover crop biomass can constrain crop establishments and the placement of fertilizers, as I was mentioning. The, in Beltsville, they're experimenting with this a little bit by using um, subsurface banding or poultry litter to add fertility into their system there. So cutting through the residue um, and then providing the nitrogen more in time with what the crop is asking for. And you can provide that nitrogen below the mulch decomposition. And so I think um, Rodale and other folks that are interested in this are also experimenting with other ways to add the fertility like this one here. 
So that was the end on the Rodale one. And I wanted to, one other study, because this one has more on water quality, and it's in Iowa, but there's few of them that focus on water, so I wanted to, to bring this one in as well. But anybody have any questions or comments? Why? <laughs> I go faster when everyone's quiet, so. <laughs> Um, so there's two parts to the Iowa work, and so the first one, this um, has, it's comparing one conventional, which just a two-year corn, corn soybean, and then there's three organic treatments, and they're differentiated in part by how much time there's for alfalfa, comparing the three and four here, and then um, the other four-year adds a second um, corn planting. So this was established in 1998, and here the interestingly the yields have been very comparable between the organic and the conventional. And even during the transition, where as I mentioned, oftentimes it's around 30% decline, the uh, decline was it was around very similar. And so they attributed that to their producer who was working that had some organic experience and was able better able to manage weeds and that the soil was pretty fertile, fertile that they were working with to begin with. Um, compared to that specific um, conventional rotation, the organic soils had greater carbon and nitrogen, biologically active carbon and nitrogen, and they had equal uh, amounts of aggregate stability. This, in, this part, the mineralizable end is important again for organic producers who are so, re so reliant on the compost and manure or cover crops to provide their fertility. So um, this is why they're doing that comparison there. You can see that it is higher in the organic system as it's good for the organic system because that's where they're trying to get a lot of their nitrogen from. And in the last figure here, just give a point of range, there was 36% more active um, in 2010, that, just to compare those numbers there. Then this was the other work in Iowa, more recently established, this one looking at water quality. And so there were just, there's just three rotations. This one is introducing a pasture rotation, pasture and hay, and then just one conventional, one organic. It's the conventional two-year and organic four-year. And they're using dairy compost in the, uh, in the organic system. Um, and they have continuous tile flow monitoring. They're in this collecting weekly water quality samples. They have a weather station on site to compare with those, with those samples. And here the results are showing that the organic rotations reducing tile nitrate concentrations and reducing nitrogen loss in the tile drainage water. So the, the nitrogen loss on the left, at the bottom it has, there's a summary down here, or a, um, adding the, the years together. And you can see the conventional corn soybean having a lot higher and the, the pasture being the most successful in that um, specific measure there. And some variation in terms of the nitrate <coughs> concentrations, but that the conventional one having higher levels than the, the two organic, and that the pasture having really low concentrations there. Conventional meetings, non-organic, or conventional meetings so. um, In this case, it would be both, actually. <laughs> um, so, any questions on those? Uh, other questions or comments? So I wanted to provide a little bit of update from the National Organic Standards Board related to this, this topic. Um, so there's new guidance coming out from the National Organic Program. They, uh, so there's the regulations and then over time, the National Organic Program develops additional guidance because they're, like I was mentioning before, it can oftentimes be pretty vague. And so in this instance, it's around maintain or improve natural resources of the operation, including soil and water quality. And so this is a pretty broad area. Natural resources is a pretty, pretty huge topic. <laughs> and so 
there, um, it could be anything about riparian areas, improving soil, and so it's kind of a wide range of topics. And so the National Organic Program has draft uh, guidance, which should be coming out in the next um, month or two, to provide some additional examples and to try to flush it out a little bit more. And they're trying to also to increase consistency among the certifiers. So ACA is the accredited certifiers, and so that actually do the organic inspections and the certification across the country. And there was some variation in how people were interpreting this rather broad <laughs> um, calling for to, pro to protect natural resources. And so we're trying to have a little bit more consistency among certifiers in this. Wait, so where do certifiers go at this point? So are you, you're actually a certifier as well as work? I them. work for a certifier. I don't do inspections myself. But okay, um, but you have people that do inspections. Yes. And so um, the consistency is always a question people who are in the non-organic world have, I think. Sure. Because they hear that. So if you were somebody who wanted to do that, is it regional at this point? Are you striving for national? I know national seems to me um, hard because there's regionality. So I'm yeah. just curious what they're... Yeah, sure. So the... Um, one of the things that's interesting about the organic is so there's the vague language around natural resources and then certifiers the way it works is that they fill out and what's called an organic system plan and so they describe all of their practices and they're um, spurred by questions all along here so the question might just be how are you maintaining or improving natural resources and then the producer writes in what they're doing and then the certifier really only has, and then that becomes sort of like their contract with the certifier, and they have to follow the practices that they've outlined in there. And so that is kind of, in a way, it's, it's sort of, some organic producers are gonna be more ambitious in their um, preservation of natural resources, and you know they care more about it, or, or, or whatever. They, or maybe they just identify more practices that they're doing, and they offer up that they're gonna be doing more practices, and then the certifiers basically um, guaranteeing that what they said they are gonna do is what they're going to do. And so I think the guidance offers um, additional the types of activities that they could be doing that would fall within that category. And so certifiers could be encouraging them to do more. But the standard is really kind of as a baseline standard. And so as long as they are doing something to improve natural resources and they are doing it, then that's kind of where the certifier is left. The cert certifiers can't require more than what's in the standard. And if it's interpreted widely that you know, doing a crop rotation is improving the natural resources or something like that, and that's what they're doing, then they're meeting that basic standard. And you can't require something greater than that. Well, as an IPM coordinator, we went through trying to develop IPM standards and having a list of practices, and you had to do 75%, say. Mm -hmm. To say you're doing IPM and that became an issue, there is no numerical kind of assignment to practices right. that happens. Right? There's not a numerical assignment. And that was a discussion around this guidance because in the there's a couple pages of the types of activities around soil or water and things like um, on soil composition, it'll say adding organic matter to increase the diversity of soil organisms or um, talking about vegetative covers for filtering grass for waterways. And so there was a little bit of a discussion, like maybe you have to do five of them to check off, but that isn't the case. And so it's a tough discussion, I know. Yeah, it is. And I think part of it is around um, education for the certifiers and the inspectors to go out and, you know, offer other things that the producer could be doing to improve. Sometimes this, the inspector doesn't feel like they're necessarily an expert in natural resources. They also have to cover, a lot of time what they're doing is like an audit trail. They're looking through the seed packages to make sure they bought organic ones and then how much they planted and going through all their records and stuff. So they're not necessarily experts on conservation those sorts of topics. And so, but then also the um, guidance does point to NRCS programs, and so I think there is a lot of opportunity for organic producers to work with NRCS who does have that expertise 
on conservation types of things that maybe the inspector, the staff inspector, doesn't really have that. And they also are not, they can't consult the staff inspector as a certifier to have a conflict of interest to telling them how to fill out your form that you would pass. And so there's, it's a, tr it's a balance too, even if they did have some suggestions on how to offer that. So I have lots of questions, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Um, but the whole notion of this whole group that's sitting here are certified crop advisors, and that evolved from people wanting to have base level competency and all of that. Um, so is there any ever discussion related to what you just said, um, a certifier having some base level competency to be able to go out and do this? Yeah, they have, um, they have a training at the IOIA, the International, or it's an inspectors association. They go for a training for a week and however long it is. And they do have that training and then it's up, because a lot of inspectors are independent, they don't necessarily work for one specific certifier, then it's kind of up to the certifier to decide if they want to work with them. And, um, but they, they can range in their expertise. And I think because a lot of the organic inspection kind of is an, an audit of, you know, it's, they're required to keep um, records for five years of all their planting and their harvest and all the materials that they use. And so a lot of the time is spent looking through that stuff because they can't be out there every day to see erosion or those types of things. And so they're kind of looking at what practices it is that they're doing and that they're mentioning to, to try to get at that. And so, thank yeah, you. yeah, thank you. Um, so these are the types of things that are mentioned in that guidance as examples of the types of activities they could be doing, which even though this isn't a pers prescriptive in the sense that they, again, that they have to do five or 10 of these, it, it is actually an improvement in the sense that it was before it was just improve uh, natural resources. And then there also have been some concerns around uh, soil conservation and uh, there have been instances when um, organic producers are, are out of compliance in terms of erosion, and they, but yet they technically are not out of compliance in terms of their organic certification because it, the organic certification, again, is like a process-based thing, and so they're saying they're using crop rotations or cover crops to prevent erosion, and that's all they really have to go on in terms of the certifier, but they could technically be out of compliance with their erosion. And so how these two things mesh <laughs> is, is unclear. And so they're not using, uh, certifiers don't use um, tools to go out and measure erosion like in NRCS. They don't use the Russell 2 tool to predict organic matter or, or anything like that. They're just, again, looking at the types of practices that are occurring in not it's not outcome based and uh, so anyway there's interest around this topic and so the national organic program asked the national organic standards board which is the place where there's public input and um, the discussions around the organic standards they asked them to look more into this and they did they talked about soil conservation being an important component of organic and that it's part of the organic system plan already and they're using more qualitative methods um, to inspect for this topic, like I was mentioning. So just visual observation or um, production practices and not tools that would evaluate erosion. And they did, again, see some opportunities to improve consistency among the certifiers and how they're assessing it and possibly do some education for inspectors, possibly pointing to NRCS programs or conservation districts to help out with that assessment. And then exploring methods for testing for soil health. Soil testing isn't required per se in the organic in, under the organic standards since a lot of producers might soil test regularly and if they write that into their organic system plan then they have to do it but there isn't a rule in the standard that says they must soil test. It's certainly a good practice as it is with any producer, but so if there was another tool of test maybe to explore um, soil health is another possibility of what they were thinking about. And they're working on a proposal for future meetings around, around this topic. And I just wanted to point out because I work with NRCS so much that there's 
a lot of um, overlap and a lot of opportunity here. And so NRCS <coughs> programs, which we're hoping that more certifiers will encourage um, their producers to go seek help with NRCS because, again, the inspector might be limited in that type of opportunities. But on the soil, um, well, this is just a, an NRCS flyer around um, practices for organic producers, kind of highlighting how they're, they work well with the types of requirements that organic producers are already need to follow around things like soil health and biodiversity. And on the, the NRCS soil health stuff, there are some profiles of organic farmers now too, and so they're trying to reach out more to that community, and I think that is a great potential um, partnership there, or a great opportunity for organic producers to go to uh, NRCS for assistance on these topics. That was what I wanted to cover. Are there any questions or comments from me? Questions for Ben? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, somebody. I was just going to say that in Maryland, they have to give a nutrient management plan, so they have to slow this. Okay. So that's but a, that's a requirement outside of certification, but all producers have to do a nutrient. It's required that they do a soil test and do everything else a commercial grower does as far as soil fertility, pea level, and all that. And so, therefore, they are. To look into that because I think that will be something that is already set up and coming. Sure, sure. Thanks. <laughs>